All right, everybody, welcome to a very special, unusual session of Kansas Week. No open, obviously, as you just saw. <laughs> and we have a panel of guests. We're doing this all online because KPTS is in the process of moving from one building to another and could not uh, record an episode this week. We will have, however, an episode on KPTS next week for those keeping track. So we're just going to discuss some of the things from this first week of the legislative session because it's very, very important. Of course, one of the biggest things from the first week of the session is always the budget. You get the state of the state and then you get the budget. So we're going to go to me at the state house from earlier this week talking about the budget real quick uh, and what lawmakers told me about it. And then we'll discuss here in a minute. Uh, let me get there's a share screen. Let me get that going. And let's see what they told us earlier this week. Maybe. There we go. Come on. The Republican legislative majority is taking kind of a wait and see attitude about the Democratic governor's proposed budget. They tell me that while it's the best one they've seen in the two years he's been in office, they're still not willing to commit to one particular part. There are a lot of details that we still have to do. Absolutely. Look, all the state lawmakers I spoke with who were there for the rollout of the governor's budget priority on Tuesday morning, which include nearly a billion dollars in tax relief in the form of cutting state grocery sales taxes to zero, giving Kansas taxpayers a $250 one-time rebate, and ending the $4 surcharge on vehicle registration renewals. It's not very popular, but we need to make sure that we really need to make sure it does have to be the legislation that we fight for the largest piece of this budget. The governor also wants more money for K-12 education, where kids are accessible to create a statewide dyslexia coordinator and expand the state's mental health prevention program. He also wants to put back money cut from higher education budget due to COVID and continue the freeze on tuition for one more year. For state employees, the chief proposal will back for kids in kindergarten as well as $1.3 billion in upgrades to highway patrol to air safety and one class for young people in the state. But the office says the chief is taking a pause. We're banking on state general fund increases and tax reductions uh, in order to balance out the down year. That's a dangerous, dangerous move. Plus, there's a deadline for plans to pay down state debt by doing things like paying back six pages of state pension funds early and $600 million. During this month, we had a legislative budget meeting, and obviously there is no negotiating. There's a lot of the items that are in the budget that I'm While the budget is generally one of the first things that lawmakers see when it comes to the peak of the session, also usually one of the last things they actually vote on, and that's the changes to election year politics. Who knows when we'll find out how much of these proposals become reality. Live from the State House, Sheila Pedraza, KPTS, on your side. Okay. Yep. Nope. We're not going to watch the commercial. <laughs> okay. So. We've got some budget. That's some of the things that I heard. Diane, I know you were kind of out there. What are some of the things you heard as well about this? Diane Leffler with Wichita Eagle joining us. Well, I think the uh, main thing um, that my readers want to know about the budget is, are we going to get that cut in the uh, sales tax? Is it, going to, uh, is it going to zero out or is it going to be some other plan that uh, may not completely remove that, uh, may not completely remove that tax this time around? Um, I think that's, uh, pretty up in the air right now. And uh, so that's that's something I'm watching very closely on behalf of uh, the, my readers uh, who are very, very, very interested in that uh, in that debate. I'd have to agree with you there, Diane. I think my viewers are very interested in that one as well. Uh, we're going to bring uh, Christy Williams in, uh, state representative, Republican from Augusta. Christy, you're going to be one of the folks uh, making some of these decisions. What do you think? What are the chances on this uh, sales tax for groceries being cut? Well, a couple of thoughts on that. I agree with Diane that, you know, sales tax is too high, but so is property tax. Every time you go uh, to make a purchase of a vehicle, that sales tax, that personal, um, well, that sales tax and that personal property tax is too high. My question would be, you know, why did the governor veto it a couple of years ago when we had uh, sales tax on a bill? Um, 
cuts and she did veto it. And then my other concern would be for small communities in which they don't have very many retail stores. The only thing they may have is a grocery store. If you cut entirely all of the sales tax on food, those small communities that may only derive income from a grocery store are going to have nothing to fund their local governments. And then that's going to cause them to have to increase property tax. So I think we need to take a careful look at it. And I think there may be some good alternatives. Well, I will say, Chrissy, I think my understanding of the proposal is that it's state sales tax being lowered to zero. Henry, you were in that meeting. It, it, isn't that what we heard? This is Henry Helgerson, Democrat from Wichita, from Eastboro. Yeah, yeah, that, that's correct. It's the state sales tax and doesn't touch the local. So that would stay in place. But, you know, I, I, I know the governor and many legislators would like to get through it very quickly, but I'm sure that both the House and the Senate will give it uh, a good deal of time to analyze the pros and cons on the sales tax, but we're going to be looking at a whole list of other amendments, I'm sure. Yeah, and I know she asked in her state of the state for a clean bill on the sales tax. Uh, Chrissy, this goes back to what you were talking about earlier with the vetoed bill a couple of years ago. It was attached to another tax uh, initiative that uh, the governor did not like. Um, so this time she's asking for a clean bill. Chances of that happening. Henry? <laughs> well, I'm one of the individuals that's supporting a clean bill, but I also know that many of my friends on the other side have a series of amendments and it'll be hard to stop individuals from offering the amendments. Um, you know, in some ways, I, it would be nice to have a discussion, Democrats, Republicans, House and Senate and say, let's put some general parameters. We don't want to go overboard on tax reductions because I believe that this economy while it's going great for the state revenue, you know, I'm nervous that it's not going to be there in a year or two years or three years from now. And, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that wiser minds will, you know, control our appetite for tax reductions and for spending. And how much, too, is this uh, a matter of politics? I mean, it's an election year. We have a governor's election. Uh, the governor, the, the, the incumbent governor, Governor Kelly, is uh, pushing for this. Um, how how dedicated? I'll ask this of the uh, of the politicians here. I mean, how dedicated is the Republican Party to not giving Governor Kelly that victory? Well, if you look at the whole budget, budget, I think there are some things that we can all agree on, and uh, reducing our debt for example, in capers and, and growing that rainy day fund. I think that's something everybody can get behind. Uh, ratcheting down the uh, sales tax on food, I think you're gonna probably find some level of agreement, but there are many other costs to families besides just that. So I wouldn't wanna necessarily just only focus on that. And just to follow up with the comments um, related to local governments, local governments of people that go into those stores they may not understand why am I still paying 2%? I thought it was zero. So there's that confusion. And then you got to think about, uh, for example, Starbond districts that may have a giant super Walmart or a Dillon's in them. And now we're not going to be able to pay our debt service on those particular districts. So it is not as easy to get uh, to a solution as it often appears. It's not just 13 words, as the governor said in her State of the Union address. It's more complicated than that. Okay, I'm going to ask this question, uh, kind of pivot a little bit away from the sales tax issue, obviously something a lot of people care about, but there's a lot of other stuff in this budget from uh, tuition freezes to money for the KHP. Christy, let's start with you. What do you think is probably the most important aspect of this budget? Well, first of all, that we actually have money in it and we, we you know, we're not having to borrow from next year, but the, the most interesting crucial part is of it is that we have an opportunity to pay off some debts. Um, I really like you know, adding some money to deferred maintenance for higher education. It's something that they've been asking for for a period of time. Um, there are some common sense um, tweaks that make sense and you know, I'm, I'm for that. Um, and of course, just you know, there's a lot of things to look at, and I don't know about the long-term impact about more pay raises. I know that inflation is a factor, and everybody has to live within that, but then that's going to go on for years to come. So I probably have more questions than answers today. 
<laughs> Henry, what about you? What what parts of this budget do you like the best? The ex, the tremendous amount of money that we had. We've never had this amount of money. And um, let me go back. And in an election year, it's a dangerous precedent because politicians will throw money at tax reductions and spending and you know, they won't be as, uh, I'll say, critical thinkers as you'd like. Uh, you know, I heard an interesting proposal from part of the Republican leadership, and that was maybe we go fairly slow on things. We don't do as many tax reductions and we don't do as much spending. We give it a chance to sit in our coffers for a little bit and just settle, settle down and see is this recovery going to last? You know, that has some benefit. You know, uh, I'd be a very, very cautious before we jump off the, either the spending or the tax reduction ledge. All right, I'm gonna ask both of you, Christy, Hen Henry, are, is there anything on the budget that you think that we haven't talked about yet that you think we really should have discussed? Well, I am excited about the water plan because <laughs> of, as a former mayor, and having to, you know, dredge and deal with emptying a lake out, uh, it's a huge issue. You know, the siltation is a huge issue in some areas, and that is one of our most important resources. So, if we can take a, you know, take this opportunity to up that, you know, and you know, protect our water, that'll save us in the future. Henry, what about you? The, you know. I was there when we passed the water plan. That goes back 20, 30 years ago. So it, it's nice to see that, but it's also nice to try to be, to have the funds to correct some of the games that we had to play in order to balance the budget over the last 25 years. So that has some real opportunities. I would add, maybe we can also get back to taking care of the mentally ill, the way we designed when we put together mental health reform. That would be great. All right, it's gonna be a long time, obviously, uh, the Ways and Means Committee, the Appropriations Committees, they are going to, they're already digging into this, they're gonna be spending months on it. Uh, we probably won't see a result, what, March, April? You asked yeah. me a question? <laughs> yeah, when do you think we're gonna see a final budget? Take a guess. An educated guess on your part. You've been on this committee for a long time, Henry. May, May, June. Yeah, I was going to say, I've, I've got June in the pool. <laughs> Please, Come uh, on, I have a vacation in June. Don't do that to me. <laughs> no, my apartment runs out by then too, but you know, uh, that doesn't matter. <laughs> All right. Well, obviously, while the budget is probably the biggest issue we hear about in the first week, it was not the only thing. And this year, we had a couple of new uh, executive orders from the governor that the Judiciary Committees were taking a look at um, a, whether or not to continue the governor's uh, orders only lasting for 15 days relating to COVID and helping nursing homes and hospitals deal with staffing shortages because of folks who are out sick. And the question is, should the legislature extend these orders any further? And Jackson Overstreet over here at CAKE took a look at that this week. So let's see what he found out. Whatever we look to codify, 
Okay, look, trying to turn the commercial off. Here we go. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. My uh, mouse didn't want to cooperate with us. So some uh, questions there about uh, the executive orders. Um, Diane, as you look at that, this is a far cry from where we were a year ago when it came to executive orders from the governor. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, this is... You know, she's doing what she's allowed to do, I guess, is the best way to say it. Um, on these on these particular orders, I, I am a little bit worried about them. Um, you know, most regulations exist because somebody in the past screwed something up. And as an emergency measure, I certainly understand that, you know, I mean, we're at the point in this pandemic where we are just trying to put breathing bodies into, into spots. I mean, it's the same kind of thing with the, uh, with the substitute teachers uh, where now you can substitute teach if you just have a high school diploma. I mean, at some point, I am hoping that the state will pivot back to making sure that the people who are in these positions are, are competent and have demonstrated that competency um, so as an emergency measure, I understand it. Um, I would be very, uh, distressed, um, if it were to become a permanent, uh, a permanent thing. Now, I know when I spoke with, uh, Ron Reichman, the Speaker of the House, uh, before the session gaveled in, he said one thing he liked about these is that they were very narrowly tailored and they did meet a need that is ongoing right now. Is there a way to make them last longer than the current 15 days and still avoid a permanency of order here, Christy? Well, I mean, the House is gonna actually see or, or work a bill next week. It, it was already passed out of the judiciary. And so I don't actually know the contents of the bill, but generally we don't extend it past the time that we're in the legislature. So it would probably sunset sometime in May before we finish up so that if we needed to extend it, we could. And you know, softening those regulatory requirements just makes sense. I mean, sometimes you're just gonna have to do that. Um, with the proper oversight, we can get through this with those small adjustments. Yeah, certainly a lot of places right now dealing with that shortage of personnel and just needing some warm bodies there. Henry, what do you think? No, we're in no win situations. You know, whether if, if I have a friend and I visit her in the nursing home uh, regularly, I got a notice uh, yesterday uh, during session or during the meeting that uh, one of the individuals came down with COVID in there, in, this, in the nursing home. And that causes additional problems. Anything we do is just trying to get by until we get through this. And you know we'll go one direction for a while, which the governor is proposing, and then we'll try to react a different way. It's, it's a no-win situation for everybody, just trying to get through this. Is this the best way now that you've seen how it was handled last year and how it's being handled this year? Does this feel like the best way or does it feel like it's becoming too clunky to get things done in what many are calling an emergency? You asking me? You're the one, I'm sorry, you're the one who's up there right now. So yes, I'm asking you first. Um, <laughs> it's clunky and people I'll go back to what was said previously about an election year. You know, everybody has to just put everything aside and just say, look, I don't care if you're running for office. I don't want to make you look bad. I don't want to make you look bad. I just want to try to do, and I want to try to work with you. 
everybody has to go into every day with that kind of an attitude from now on. And it's not how you get the governor or how you get the speaker or how you get the chairman. We got to work together this last few months or few years so we can get through this. And so we cut everybody a little bit more slack and we, and you know, with a little bit more Christi Christianity and with love. And that's what's necessary right now. Christy, where do you stand on this? Do you feel like this is a better way or is it proving to work as well as Republicans had hoped? You know, I actually prefer a little bit more clunky, more checks and balances than something that rolls out very fast that doesn't actually consider all the ramifications. Um, you know, in 2020, we saw over 70 different executive orders. We saw over uh, almost 30 last year. Um, and so having a couple right now that the legislature can really zero in on makes sense. We can do it in a timely fashion. We can respond. And honestly, when the legislature wants to be efficient and respond quickly, you know, Henry knows we, we are capable of doing that. We, maybe that's not the norm, but in an emergency, I do feel like we can react quickly. And we certainly did in 2020 when the pandemic started. So I would hope that we would be able to respond appropriately um, in the next uh, emergency. Okay, so uh, we've got a bill coming out. Uh, do we expect to vote on the House floor early next week then? I don't know the, the timeline, but it looks like sometime next week. Okay, all right. So we have executive orders. We're gonna see what the House says and then it would go on to the Senate from there. Or I don't know, is the Senate working their own versions of the bill and we have to meet in the middle somewhere. <laughs> I'll have to take a look at that. Um, we have some other issues to talk about. One thing that the House has already dealt with, the Senate just now taking up, is de dealing with, not dealing with the backlog of rape kits that the KBI found a few years ago, but legislation designed to prevent that from happening again. Now, the House passed it unanimously last year, but it didn't get a hearing in the Senate, and so they picked it up first thing this year, and we're moving forward. It's already headed toward the full Senate. And I took a look at that earlier this week. So let's see if I can get that up for everybody. Yep, my help if I started sharing. There we go. The first item senators in this committee took up a house bill that would require law enforcement agencies to get rape kits processed as soon as possible and to hold any rape kits not caught by a criminal case for at least 10 years. I think the backlog of the kits was reported, uh, you know, how it translates to how many kids are not reported. Uh, I, I think this makes common sense and this time to do something about it. Lindsay Ford with the Kansas Coalition Against Sexual Assault told lawmakers these changes would be a big deal for assault survivors who'd already lost control over their body once and then would essentially have to give it up again for 46 hours to collect evidence. I sat with survivors through that process and it is it is very challenging for them. And I have also sat with them in the aftermath and they've learned that, you know, for whatever reason, their case has not been prosecuted and their, their case still hasn't been tested. Others told lawmakers that simply processing the case here in Kansas could have cases that didn't necessarily see any help catch as a real rape. In 2017, um, the initiative reported that out of 496 testing kits, 30% uh, of the identified offenders had been known to the victim and had trackable previous attention were high frequency offenders. The bill would also allow other organizations like child advocacy centers to perform the exams. And we, and we can send these people still, you know, after they have a question, you know, after they have felt that they have survived and that we can still do the exam. The Senate bill on to the full Senate for approval, but because it carried over from one year to the next, even if the Senate votes yes, the House will still have to vote on it again as well. From the State House, Kulan Draza, Kansas News, on the South. Okay. So this feels like almost a done deal to a certain extent from everybody I've spoken with. Uh, and I think maybe it's because of some of those numbers that we saw come out of going back and processing that backlog of rape kits when Ms. Connect said that 30% were known to the victims and were repeat offenders, that 
person that that specific one just floored me. Diane, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, does anybody but me find it absurd that we haven't passed this law a long time ago? Um, it's really hard to argue that delaying the processing of rape kits uh, is, is, is an allowable thing under any circumstances. And, you know, I, I just, I mean, this has gone on for years and I just don't, I don't understand why this hasn't been done you know, 10 years ago when it first came to light, frankly. Yeah. Well, the KBI requested it last year. The House already passed it. You guys are going to have to take another look at it. I, Christy, uh, Henry, I, do either of you guys have a thought on, you know, the Senate could have looked at this last year, but they put other bills ahead of it in the queue. Does it feel like maybe it got a little bit of short shrift? I never like to comment on the Senate, but I am so glad the House got on it and that we'll have a chance again to finalize it this year. And it's a shame that it took as long as it did for the legislature to act on it. And I would just hope any agency would reach out to the legislature when they don't have the resources they need to take care of critical things such as you know, the rape kit so that justice could be upheld. So I don't know how many other situations exist out there that are like that, but I would urge that our agencies make sure that they, they communicate that with the legislature. Henry, what about you? Are you willing to comment on the Senate? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> Senate sometimes- Speaking as an ex-Senator. <laughs> yeah, as a, I, uh, you're right. I thought about that too. Um, as an ex-senator, I understand that they have certain challenges. Uh, you know, the legislature just gets bogged down with the, the bureaucracy at times. You know, there's no excuse for it taking seven years to work through all this, except that there were other priorities and there wasn't enough money and there wasn't enough testing labs and et cetera, et cetera. But now that we know that the, that the system was broken, there's no excuse to not getting this passed right away. And even though they, the Senate and the House didn't agree last year to get it done, it's not that we didn't get the press the kits uh, dealt with. It's just that we didn't get the statute in place to require not to have a backlog again. There won't be a backlog for many years because nobody wants that and we have enough revenue to take care of that. Yeah, I was going to say one of the questions that was raised in that hearing was, would there be money needed to ensure they have enough space to store all of these kits for 20 years and make sure they can process things immediately, even if a case isn't necessarily being prosecuted right now. And uh, the KBI's spokesperson, Jacobs, told them, yeah, we've gotten some uh, grants for that. We're all set. Everything's in place. So some good news there. And definitely something we'll be keeping an eye on. And I'm sure House members are eager to see head back their way. Um, something else that I know a lot of people are thinking about are those horrible wildfires that we had a few weeks ago out in Western Kansas uh, because of that windstorm. And, you know, so much need out there. We've done so many stories about various groups donating items to the folks out there who are in need, who are basically burnt out. They lost their homes, they lost their farms, they lost their businesses the animals on the farms is just devastating what's going on out there. And there's one bill that is starting to work its way through the system that's designed to help out a little bit. And we're gonna to go to KSN's Rebecca Chung to take a look at that. Maybe. There we go. Who are trying to fast track that bill a group of senators voted to pass it out of committee and fix tax exemptions for certain property that was damaged after these wildfires swept through thousands of acres and their tax advantage. Wildfires spreading across the state, damaging land, burning buildings, and killing cattle. The brunt of the damage happening in western Kansas after high winds in December. Winds blew the trees so quick, and we've had almost every county fire vehicle up here. A month later, and people are still trying to pick up the and Kansas lawmakers are hoping to help with a bill that gives tax exemptions for fencing. Senators also adding exemptions to property taxes, helping people repair what could cost them 
thousands of dollars in damage. If it's not a home, he would still owe property tax on that property. So we need to fix that. The fiscal note is minimal compared to the devastation that these individuals. The bill is gaining bipartisan support. Republicans and Democrats are hoping to take action soon. Government should still have to improve our own taxes, especially by natural or even sometimes man-made taxes. Now, the House also has their own version of the bill. Depending on what changes they make, they could move pretty quickly. Right now, that bill in the Senate is set to be brought to the floor next week for debate. For now, reporting at the Capitol, I'm Rachel Chung. Okay. I got to wonder how much debate we're actually talking about here. <laughs> as we uh, talk about this, because it seems to be everybody I've talked to is in favor of this aid. Christy, you talked about how quickly the legislature can move at times. It seems like this may be one of those cases. Yeah, Kansans want to help Kansans. This is not a really difficult one to choose on. The only thing I would say is that sales tax exemptions are not my favorite thing at all, but I can't think of anything more worthy than a temporary sales tax exemption for an emergency when Kansans have lost something um, very valuable to them and they need help. Henry, what do you think? Uh, this is moving pretty quickly here. Uh, does, are there any issues with the bill itself or does it seem like it's uh, pretty good to go? No, I think I don't think there'll be any problems with it. Everybody's in, in, in agreement with it. And, and part of the reason that we're doing the fences and the sales tax on fences is because I think the fiscal note was, was it 1.7, 1.6? And insurance doesn't cov cover the replacement of the fences. That's why the state chose to help in that in that direction. Oh, that makes sense. I, I know Diane, you and I both have covered uh, to a certain extent what's going out going on out in Western Kansas, and it, there's no doubt that this as much help as this will be, it's still just a drop in the bucket. Oh yeah, I mean, there the needs are are immense. Um, it it does sort of take away kind of that being taxed on something that you no longer have. Um, it's kind of like uh, a few years ago with the mobile homes that were destroyed in the uh, tornadoes um, and people were still having to pay property tax on the full value of that of that home. Um, so, you know, it is it is a little bit, but little bits help. And uh, if there if this is combined with a property tax uh, with, with some property tax relief as well, um, it could be a good thing. No. Well, and those little bits start to add up after a while. Uh, I'm looking at the clock here, and we've actually already gone longer than Kansas Week <laughs> usually lasts. So I think we're just going to do one more topic, and I would go ahead and end it, but this one is one that uh, you all know I've been following for a long time, suspended driver's licenses. Made some changes in law last year, big celebration last summer here in Wichita. Now some concerns being raised that the city courts in Wichita are not taking advantage of the changes and also some other loopholes in, in the law that people are finding that are leaving some Kansans uh, facing some serious fines and maybe even some jail time. So let me get that one going here. Um, share. More than 200,000 Kansans with extended driver's licenses. It's a total number that hasn't changed much over the last couple of years. But after state lawmakers passed a new law this year, we have seen a change in how many of them are from Wichita and Central County, down from about half to about a quarter of that total. But still, there are holes in those laws that some say are sending Kansans to jail. Uh. Mike Dickey's investigation helped that's a law designed to help Kansans get their licenses back. This has been a proud moment for me to get this. I hadn't had a legal driver's license in 14 years. Kansans like Bobby Lytle. After years in and out of prison, Lytle turned his life around, got a job, became active in his church's ministry, and earned the right to get back behind the wheel. Just four months later, that license is in jeopardy, and Lytle may find himself headed to jail. I knew that I was driving illegal. It was just, there's no excuse. I own up to that. With three driving while suspended convictions to his name, the law says Lytle should have to spend three to 12 months behind bars, in addition to paying thousands of fines and court fees. The law also
also gives judges and prosecutors leeway to make adjustments if they think the defendant is making a good faith effort. It took me a year and a half working two jobs to obtain uh, close to $15,000 I paid in fines between Derby, Hayes Hill, Derby County, and Wichita Municipal. But once his fine was paid, the Wichita Municipal Court ordered jail time. None of the efforts mattered. I don't really want to think that they need the money. Uh, I don't have basically have people who are in poverty. Lytle so, turned to Central County Commissioner Jim Powell for help, who began to ask why. I asked our, our uh, RCAP to reach out to their staff. This was the answer county staffers brought him. An email reporting the city's chief prosecutor said, as a policy, they don't reduce charges when someone is arrested for driving on a suspended license. This is a policy choice. And we have the authority under standard law to have some consideration that they're turning their back on those options. They're being hard on them as, as po hard as possible on this person. And it's it, it breaks my heart. In addition, Howell says, Kansas law has what's called a lifetime look back when considering driving while suspended charges, meaning the court looks back over your entire life for previous incidents, no matter how long ago. There's really nothing else on the criminal record that says if you did something when you're 15 years old or 17 years old or even 18 years old, and you're in your 50s right now, so that's going to come back and it's going to add to your penalty. The two things Howell says he'd like to see lawmakers change this season, along with the length of jail time for driving while suspended, because while a second driving while suspended conviction can come with up to a year behind bars. As Congress, we point this out, that for domestic violence, a separate offense, is five days in custody for domestic violence battery. The city says that it doesn't matter. Lytle has appealed this case to the county court, but doesn't hold out much hope for any changes. He just hopes by sharing his story, it might help others. He also feels he's done what society asked him to do, to make up for past wrongs. I paid those prices, and I've done more than that. I've stepped above and beyond to meet our community standards about what's required to get that driver's license back. We did ask to speak with somebody from either the city or the municipal court about this policy, but we're told because it involves an ongoing criminal case, they can make no comment. From the State House, Sheila Pedraza, Cake News, Investigate. Update tonight's look at Okay. So, uh, some interesting data there. I a note on the numbers that I mentioned off the top. We are still sitting at about 211,000 suspended drivers in Kansas. Uh, that includes DUI suspensions. Um, Sedgwick County is responsible for about 18,500 of them. Less than 1% are DUI, however. Wichita Municipal Court is responsible for about 24,000. Again, less than 1% are DUI cases. The rest are fines, fees, driving while suspended, that sort of thing. This is something that I've spoken with a lot of lawmakers already, and they're very concerned about. Uh, Christy, Henry, I wanted to kind of get your, your just first reactions looking at this story. Uh, Henry, why don't we start with you? I'm surprised. I thought we'd taken care of it last year, but I, you know, as it happens, there are surprises or things that we don't realize. Uh, I look at the mood of the legislature, and that is give, give people an opportunity to correct the situation, uh, turn their lives around, and work with them in trying to move ahead. And I think we'll probably correct the problems that you've brought up in this story. Christy, what do you think? I was, I was just going to add that the legislature might need to take a, another look at this lifetime look back and Central County judges are probably going to need to look back at their policies that they've been following for year after year and uh, update those, modernize those and consider the things that uh, Representative uh, Helgerson just mentioned. Let's give people an opportunity to get their lives back in order and uh, you know, right now employment's an issue everywhere. And so we want these individuals to be back in the workplace and adding to their own communities, their own families, and, and to our state. Yeah. And Christy, Diane, I know I... you were at the uh, celebration of the uh, uh, ceremonial signing here in Wichita of the, of the bill last summer, and you wrote quite a piece on it as well. I know several folks I spoke to then said they didn't think the job was done. They thought more, more laws needed to be changed. I, I do just want to, to uh, clarify something, um, uh, Representative Williams. 
uh, it's not, as I understand it, the Sedgwick County Court uh, that's the issue here. It's the Wichita City of Wichita Municipal Court. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I just think it's an important distinction because that's, uh, you know, I mean, they're all in Sedgwick County, but there are, you know, the two different court systems and one doesn't seem, at least I haven't heard this problem coming out of the, out of the county court. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard it, you know, many times from the uh, municipal court. Um, yeah, it's, uh, in a lot of cases, this is just a tax on being poor. Um, you get a, you get a fine, you can't afford to pay it. So you don't pay it. Then they increase the fine. And now you, now you have, you're, you're twice as unlikely to pay that fine. And then they take your driver's license away, but you still got to go to work. You still got to pick up your kids at school. You still got to, you know, get your groceries and do those things. And, uh, then you wind up on a suspended license and then you're facing, you know, if it happens again, you're facing jail time. And it's just, uh, I can't even begin to understand why a system would want to put people in jail during, <clears throat> during an international pandemic that is killing people, particularly people who are confined in, in, in close tight groups. Um, it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Uh, that, you know, especially in this climate, that you could go to jail for, you know, for driving on a suspended license, if that's the only thing, you know, I mean, obviously DUI, you know, that mm -hmm. might be a different, uh, that might be a different story because you're, 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 you're actively putting people in danger. But, you know, just because you got a traffic fine once that you couldn't pay, you know, I mean, that it just, it's, it's, it's like Le Miserable. You know, it, it just, you know, the, the punishment doesn't fit the crime. Yeah. Oh, I know. I was speaking with uh, Senator Aletha Fausto, and she's really been kind of the main driver behind a lot of uh, these efforts uh, for several years. And uh, she said she's already filed uh, Senate Bill 317 that would add revoked driver's licenses to as long as it's not for DUI to the list of those who could work on getting the restricted license and getting back on the road using the new measures that we that were passed last year. Um, another one of those kind of, I won't say loopholes, but groups of folks who are left out of the original bill that uh, she's trying to get them taken care of as well. Well, and you want there to be judicial discretion in these things because mm -hmm. there are some like horrible things that people can do with a vehicle. <laughs> that, you know, maybe they need to, you know, maybe they do need to serve some jail time to get their attention. But, you know, just, just not paying a fine or filling out mm. the right piece of paperwork or, you know, showing up at the right time. I mean, those, those, you know, kinds of things, you know, it's, it's very, very difficult for lower income people to comply. And, uh, you know, it just, it, it just seems heartless, I guess. Yeah. Well, I know one thing that uh, it has been an issue with this as well is that there are so many people that are directly impacted. I, since I started doing this series, I think it was 2019 was when I did the first story. And I have had so many people reach out to me and every story that I hear from each individual person is a little bit different. And the law is a little bit different. And I think maybe that's kind of part of the problem in trying to solve this solution. But I know that a lot of them, it's about the fees that get attached on top of the original fine, the late fees and the court fees and all that sort of thing. Uh, and I know I've read some articles uh, about municipal government um, from social scientists saying that a lot of munis municipal courts rely on those fees simply to uh, continue to operate. That's how they pay their people and get their funding. And I believe it was in the state of the state, Dion, that the governor asked to end that practice. Or was that the state of the judiciary there the same day? I didn't, I don't remember. Sorry. Yeah. One of them asked <laughs> they, to end the practice of using, of uh, supporting courts with fines and fees, especially fees, because again, kind of like you said, Diane, that does end up becoming a poverty tax. Christy, what do you think about that idea? 
Well, I think the Supreme uh, Court Justice uh, mentioned that she didn't want to rely on the fees. She wanted that to go into the general fund. So there was some mention of that. Um, you know, I, I'm just not an expert in the judiciary, so I would want to know a little bit more about it. And I feel very compassionate towards those individuals that are facing these situations. But again, coming from a municipality, um, I found that the judges that I have worked with have been extremely understanding and compassionate and tried to work with the individuals and trying to give them opportunities to come back or to pay later, pay what they can. I understand that not everybody's that way and, and that's unfortunate, but I don't have a legislative solution in mind for that. Henry, what about you? First, it was the judiciary that said that they want to, their budget assumes that the fee structure is goes into the state general fund and the state general fund support the courts, basically a one for one trade off, but sit, change the system on how that works. Uh, the governor's office also said later on that they put that into their budget. We haven't seen it yet, but that's what we were told, uh, which would be a dramatic change. Um, I think the local municipalities stick it to people that have a uh, traffic fine. I think the fees are ridiculous. And, uh, you know, the local people don't, the local elected officials quite often don't do that because they need the revenue. Uh, it has not been a higher priority for legislators to intervene into the local uh, municipal courts. Uh, but there's also the trade off that the legislature has made a conscious decision to withhold some of the money that may have been flowing back to the communities over the years to put more of a crimp on their budget. Maybe, maybe that we can deal with that this year and equalize it a little bit so that there is less of a demand for the fees at the local court system. Maybe we can figure that out too. All right. Any last thoughts, folks, uh, as we wrap this up for today? I forgot one thing. Yes. This is the first year in several years that the Medicaid expansion idea is a net positive to the state budget. I think it's like $68 million. It has always been more cost to the state to put this in. And, and the governor had a crazy idea of doing mar marijuana, uh, you know, in order to pay for it. Now, if we expand Medicaid, provide health care to 150,000 people, we will get $68 million. And for the first eight quarters, it'll be a net positive to the state. Then it'll be like $40 million we have to pay in additional health care costs after that. Man, this that time has come that we need to deal with this. And that's going to, even though the hospitals are focused on other things, the legislature, House and Senate don't want to deal with it. I can tell you that'll be an issue that's going to raise its head because first, you don't walk away from $68 million. And second, those people, many of them are mentally ill that need health care, and it would help our whole system. And I can go on and on, but you don't want to hear that. <laughs> Christy, any last thoughts? A response to Henry, whatever. <laughs> sure, thank you. Well, I, I think there are a lot of responses to the representative, but I'll hold off on that. And just thank you for having us here today. Great job reporting. Always a pleasure to see you, Diane. And uh, I hope this all worked out for you. This is so. Yeah. This technology, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we've got, got it's a new world. We're trying some new things. Diane, any last thoughts? Um, really, just. Uh... I guess we just keep watching, see what happens. Uh, one, one, one thing I do want to mention um, that uh, in the governor's uh, state of the state speech uh, that she uh, said that, uh, that she was talking about highway projects and infrastructure. And she said, uh, you know, they don't generate the big screaming headlines. And uh, that particular day, that was, my, that was our lead story. Uh, I was the number one story on Kansas.com was the uh, North Junction project here in Wichita, which was the project that she was specifically talking about. So I, I kind of had a little bit of a, a giggle about that one. I, I seem to remember um, 
leading a few newscasts with the stories about the North Junction as well. So yeah. <laughs> I'll agree with you there. <laughs> well, thank you three so much for joining me on this little ex Kansas Week experiment. Uh, viewers, let us know what you think in the comments. If you like this, then in other weeks during the session when we don't have a show on KPTS, I will try it again. If uh, you guys really don't like it, I won't waste everybody's time. So let us know what you think and have a great weekend. And we will see you on KPTS next Friday. Bye, everybody. Thank you.